So uh, I think many of you here run your own businesses or are businessmen. And if somebody were to offer you a loan, you would take it. Uh, if the loan were at 2% a day, that's about 1,000% a year, would you take it? Chances are you probably would not. You'd probably go running to your banker. Unfortunately, only 14% of people in India have access to a loan account. The rest of them have to go to the informal system and get credit. So this is a story where I actually want to talk about how we can change their life. And for that, we will focus on one person. We'll call her Rajni. Rajni wakes up in the morning. She goes out to the vegetable market. She takes a loan, and then she buys goods. She then, during the day, processes it, sells it, and then repays the loan at the end of the day. But in today's system, Rajni is not able to get a formal loan, which is why she has to go and take the loan from the informal system. And the reason, you talk to bankers, you talk to financiers, and they'll all tell you the reasons are threefold. One is the cost of sales, the actual act of going out and talking to somebody who needs a loan and then processing it. The cost of servicing the loan, once the loan is given, the act of actually the giving of the loan, the collecting of the money, all of that. And the third cost is the co that fact that there's not enough credible data about Rajni. All these three reasons means that Rajni would be denied a loan in a formal system. And even in the formal system, we have an interesting fact that customers who have the lowest default rates, and this is in the microfinance institutions where the default rates are under half a percent, they have the highest interest rates, and they pay northwards of 24% a year. Now, you know, we all, when we went to school, we learned about the risk-reward ratio and why many of us take risks as entrepreneurs is because of the risk-reward ratio. You take more risk, you get a higher reward. And we have this inversion happening. So how do we fix it? So, you know, let's first back and take a look at some of the trends in the country today. So I'm going to talk about, you have heard this acronym before, JAM. JAM stands for Jandhan, Aadhaar, and Mobile. And these three are mushrooming like wildfire in the country. So let's take a look at one at a time. The Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana was launched about two years ago. And since then, they've created about 35 million accounts. And this is a staggeringly large number because it's almost at the rate of one account per household. So there have been steps taken to bring in everybody into the formal financial ecosystem. And then we have Aadhaar. Aadhaar is a digital identity. Over the last five and a half years, it's gone from nothing to about a billion people. And this is an incredible achievement because if you think about it, there's only Across the world, only about 12 systems that have reached a billion users, and Aadhaar is by far the fastest of them. Uh, none of these... The remaining 11 systems are... Uh, this is the only system which is outside the United States. This is the only government system. Nobody else has a billion users. Even in China, I think the largest is WeChat at about 600 million. And then it is a digital identity, which is, again, a very new thing. What it means is that you can assert your identity to a program, and then you can get access to benefits. And the system is currently scaled up to support about 100 million transactions a day, and is quite scalable. The third trend that we have is the rise of phones, and not just for smartphones. We have about uh, 25 million phones a quarter being sold in the country for the past two years. Currently, about 250 million exist. And at this rate, every adult in the country will have a smartphone by 2020. And this is the foundation. And on top of this, over the last few years, we have been building this set of government systems that use JAM effectively. So Aadhaar was launched in 2010. Uh, along that, authentication was launched. The next year, it was used for providing direct benefit transfer of subsidies. This is through the Aadhaar payment bridge, 
which was not built by the UIDI, but was actually built by this entity called NPCI, the National Payments Corporation of India. And along with that, they built a system called APS, which is the Aadhaar-enabled payment system. And with that, you could, anybody with an Aadhaar linked to his bank account could walk over to a business correspondent and operate their account. That next year, because of use of KYC, Aadhaar got recognized as a valid KYC and eKYC was launched. And now you could actually provide a digital document related to proving who you are. In 2015, when uh, the current prime minister came on, he launched Digital India. As part of that, there are two initiatives. One was the e-sign. The e-sign allows anybody in the country to do a digital signature and the DigiLocker, which allows a way to send documents electronically with a lot of trust built in. And this year we launched, a month ago, the Unified Payment Interface by NPCI. And this leads us to what we call the India Stack. So the India Stack is the set of technologies which allow you to do a presenceless transaction, which means you don't need to be in front of any particular person to assert your identity. A paperless transaction, which means you can exchange digital documents, you can uh, do digital signatures, and hence do transactions without paper. And then a cashless layer, which includes IMPS, the uh, immediate money payment system, and UPI. And then on top of this, we have built a mechanism for consented data share. These together form the India stack. Now, why is this important in our Rajni story? Because we believe we now have the fundamentals to take India cashless. And the belief comes down to this hypothesis. If Rajni were to use digital footprints, the trail she leaves when she does digital transactions, to get credit, and then that credit leads to business growth, which allows her to come out of poverty, then she will ensure that all the transactions she does are cashless and paperless. So this thought is what allows us to think that whether you know, this may be the cycle that allows us to take a lot of people out of poverty. And so we said, let's put together an experiment that proves this. So we said, what does Rajni need to do to make this happen? The first is she needs to say she needs a loan. She needs to share data. This is very similar to the regular transactions that you would do in the current world. Uh, then she needs to see multiple loan offers, accept the best offer, and then receive the loan in her bank account, use it to do her daily business, and then repay the loan to start the cycle all over again. If she can do this all from her smartphone, without going to a bank, then we've achieved our dream. So for that, we need a credit marketplace, our consent architecture that I mentioned to be alive, uh, paperless contracts, and then the payment system and the transaction accounts. All of which we have enabled through the India stack. So when she opens up an account with the credit marketplace, you can use Aadhaar and eKYC to identify yourself. The DigiLocker enables data sharing with consent. And then it also, eSign and DigiLocker allow you to do paperless contracts. And the unified payment interface now in IMPS earlier allowed cashless transactions. So to prove this point, we said we should do a pilot. I mean, like all technology folks, that's what we do. Uh, we got a whole bunch of startups together and said, let's prove this. So sometime after we started talking about this, we started a pilot. It took us two months to set it up. And then we had all of these people participate in it. And we were able to get the first loan going in the month of April. And this is the most interesting number. From the time you open up the application, you select the loan amount you want. You agree to provide data about yourself. You authenticate yourself. You do the KYC process. And then you see the loan offers, it's about five minutes. Once you accept the loan and you do a digital signature, and then you get the money into your bank account, those end the three minutes. So in eight and a half minutes, <laughs> so in eight and a half minutes, we were able to get, on the average, loans to people without paper, without cash, without going anywhere. And 
This reduces the cost of giving up the loan. And while you know, there's a lot of newer players coming in doing pure database lending, we found that we were even faster and cheaper than those. And that reduces the costs anywhere from 60 to 40 to 50 percent, depending on which phase of the loan you're talking about. And that means that now you can actually give a small loan. Just as a data point, today banks don't give loans under 30,000 rupees. They'll give you a credit card because the cost of a basic uh, loan is around 5,000 rupees. And there's no way they can recover that if the loan amount is small. Now they can do that. So let's just review the layers of the stack again. Aadhaar is, of course, a unique lifetime number. It's 12 digits. For that number, the system collects uh, basic demographic data, name, date of birth, address, email address, and phone number. In addition to that, there's a photograph, 10 fingerprints, and two iris. And that ensures that each person can get only one number, and hence the system can be sure that it is a unique identity. Along with that is authentication, which allows you to assert who you are. And you can do this at any point without being in front of anybody. Only a yes or no answer is provided. The next thing, for, again, from Aadhaar is EKYC, which allows a digital identity document to be provided to somebody else with your consent. That means you no longer need to have any photocopies. And eSign is the new system which I mentioned earlier. A requirement for a digital signature is that the data in the signature corresponds to data in a public database. Aadhaar cl uh, classifies as a public database. And then if you do the signature in the middle of a transaction, then that uh, can be uh, proved that you are the same person doing the signature. And this is now a valid form of signature accepted under the IT Act. And hence, it's valid in a court of law. The digital locker, and let me sort of just take a step back and talk about this. Today, when you go out and you produce a mark sheet, and then somebody has to verify that it's unique. So you typically take a photocopy, you sign across it to say you certify it's unique. Now, this year, the Central Board of Secondary Education has placed all the 10th and 12th standard mark sheets in a digital locker. As a student, you can validate your identity and send this onwards to any university or school or college. As a result, they will trust the mark sheet without you having to give them a piece of paper or a signature. And the, and in this ecosystem, it's all applications talking to each other. And we do expect that this is the first application, I believe, in. Delhi and MP, the road transport officer, uh, officials have agreed to take driver's licenses and your RC books onto the DigiLocker as well. So very soon you'll start to see a very strong form of digital documentation coming in where trust is now established across the systems. You don't need to worry about fakes anymore. And last of all, the unified payment interface. It was just launched a month ago. 20 banks are already participating within the next Three months, we expect all the banks to be in place. Uh, it provides a very simple way to do a money transfer, both a push and a request. Uh, you don't need to exchange your bank account information with anybody. Uh, it's instant. Uh, both parties get an instant notification when the transaction happens. And that is the fundamental building blocks that we have in the India stack. This is what allows us to think in terms of credit at scale, where you have millions of borrowers who are able to access credit from thousands of lenders built on a digital infrastructure, which is completely data-driven, algorithm-driven, and with the user consent built in. And the India stack enables more than just financial use cases. It's not just about financial services. We are talking to folks about using it for skills. Skills is very similar. Today, when you employ a security guard, you don't know how much experience he has. You don't care. You don't know what certifications he has because you don't trust certifications. As a result, they, they themselves don't go for additional training because it's not going to give them differentiated earnings. Now, if you were able to trust the certifications and the skills and the experience, you would probably pay more for somebody who can do a better job. 
And if that's the case, the virtual cycle starts by building trust in the skills, the certification, the history, and that is something we believe we can enable with the India stack. We have similar use cases with health, and we are looking for many more use cases. And now I want to talk about uh, the organizations which are part of this. iSpirit is a software product industry think tank. It's, we are a bunch of volunteers. We evangelize the India stack. We are looking for use cases that will enable people to take this and go forward with all of the different use cases in the country. And I know there are many entrepreneurs here. I would love to invite you to look at what we are doing and come and participate in this journey. Uh, and the whole goal of the India stack is that it's a digital infrastructure. We want to enable hundreds of experiments that are trying to solve the hard problems across our country. Some will fail, but the others will succeed. And the ones that do will actually help us solve all of the hard problems we have. Thank you.